investing in e a r y stage startup หลายคนในที่นี้ดิฉันเชื่อว่านะคะอยากจะเริ่มธุรกิจหรืออาจจะมีธุรกิจกันอยู่แล้วนะคะแต่ว่าการที่เราจะเริ่มต้นธุรกิจโดยใช้เงินลงทุนตัวเองนั้นจะทําอย่างไรวันนี้ค่ะวิทยากรท่านนี้นะคะเป็นผู้ที่มีความเชี่ยวชาญมากเป็นผู้ที่เป็นที่ปรึกษาให้กับผู้ที่ต้องการที่จะมี business นะคะใหม่ๆเดี๋ยวเราจะมาดูกันนะคะว่าเอ๊ะเขาจะแนะนําอะไรในกรณีที่เราใช้นะเงินทุนของตัวเองนะคะที่สําคัญนะคะประสบการณ์ของเขาอย่างที่ได้บอกไปว่าเขาเนี่ยเป็นที่ปรึกษานะคะแล้วก็รวมไปถึงมีประสบการณ์ในเรื่องของการลงทุนโดยเฉพาะลงทุนในช่วงเริ่มแรกนะคะแล้วก็ที่สําคัญนะคะเขาจะมีเป็นไฮเวย์หรือว่าทางลัดให้ว่าเราจะทําอย่างไรในการเริ่มเริ่มต้นนะคะแบบนี้กับเงินทุนแท่นี้นะคะจะประสบความสําเร็จอย่างไรแล้วเขานะคะ,ะได้เดินทางมาไกลนะคะจากประเทศในแถบยุโรปด้วยเราจะมาดูกันนะคะว่าความแตกต่างการลงทุนในประเทศยุโรปกับประเทศไทยเนี่ยแตกต่างกันอย่างไรสามารถที่จะนำมาปรับใช้ได้หรือเปล่านะคะ Ladies and gentlemen in a few moments we will start the topic of investing in early stage startup and our speaker he has a professional background in IT actually but he in over a decade of professional experience He has shifted from the hardcore development to finding and selling to companies to field work in M&A and moreover to kick starting startup early stage investment in his corner of Europe with over 30 startups and many more early stage investment deal packing. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the director of coffee investment, Mr. Drokas. Hello everyone. Very happy to be here. Can you hear me really well, or maybe I don't need the mic so much? Is it okay? It's better than the mic. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll be speaking in English. Uh, is everyone okay with that? English? Okay. All right, cool. So I'll be telling you about uh, my experience in Europe in investing in early stage startups, and I. Position this presentation such that it's a guide, it's instructions in a way for investors, how to do these deals in a way for startups to understand uh, how to approach investors and understanding how investors approach this pro uh, process. All right, so I can tilt this the other way. So it's very important for me to understand who you are. And can I briefly have a show of hands if any of you has done investment before or are planning to do startup investment soon? Anyone? Okay, we have a few hands, cool. So I'll be te definitely telling you, uh, sharing the experience. All right, and the other component, do any of you currently build your startup or are planning to get funding for a startup soon? Come on guys, be brave. You know, there is a reason why you came to this conference. Okay, so a few hands. So, you know, hopefully you will find this very useful and the rest of you, hopefully you'll also find this informative. All right, so um, I'll start with introducing myself and then I'll tell you what I'll be talking about. Okay, so I'm Rokas, I'm from Lithuania. That's in Central Eastern Europe. All right, as announced, I've been investing in startups for the last few years. I have 30 companies in my portfolio, and therefore I've then, you know, I've invested in them, and then I help them raise money. Some of them are successful, and some of them not so much. So I have quite a bit of experience on both ends. Uh, to that end, I also founded an accelerator, which was one of the first accelerators in my part of Europe. So I've been doing this for several years now, and I remember how it was when no one believed you and startup what. And I also know how it is today when everybody speaks about startup and everybody is doing a startup of its own. All right, a uh, couple of flashy achievements just to give you a perspective where I stand. A couple of years ago, I was nominated in top 30 uh, young people in Nordics. That means uh, Nordic European. So uh, pretty, pretty kind of uh, gives a good standard what I was doing. And last year, I was nominated among top 10 guys in innovation in my country. So at least back home, I really drive the stuff. So. What I've been talking about, will be talking about, uh, this is my experience, and this is very kind of limited to my corner of Europe, right? So if you find that some of this doesn't necessarily completely make sense to what you guys do here, you know, take it in perspective. This is personal, and this is also uh, very much in, in, based on European experience. One big assumption I will be making, 
and you can tell me if this is so here, is that back home, you know, you probably never heard about Lithuania or barely ever, right? So we are a small country, and for us, when we invest, it's up to getting to a bigger markets really fast. So there is a certain dynamics, you know, you raise a little bit early on for your startup, and then you raise a lot more to enter some interesting market. In our case, it's mostly United Kingdom and United States. So I will assume that at least some startups in Thailand also think about entering United States and therefore have to go through similar funding patterns, basically first funding their initial operation and then funding going to the States. That makes sense? A little bit, all right? Well, if it falls completely out of line, then at least you'll get to know how, what, what it's like back home. All right, so I'll start about uh, basics, how I think angel investors and early stage investors should invest, how I invest, and you can take something from that. And then I'll go through the entire cycle. How do they find you, track the deal, what happens afterwards, and then hopefully a little bit of useful information after that. Okay? If any of you feels that you, you want to ask a question, Midstream, go ahead, just raise your hand and I'll be happy to answer. Obviously, we'll do a question session at the end, but I'm also happy to stop and answer a question as we go. All right, let's roll. So, in principle, this is the most important slide and it helps you to understand how investors should think and if you're into investment, this is something I very, very strongly advise you to think about, okay? So, first of all, if you're backing just a single startup, or you're a startup that has investor for whom you're the only investment, you're a little bit in the lottery, okay? We all know that number of startups will not be successful or at least be limitedly successful. And it's a cliche, they say one in 10 succeeds, okay? But I've, I've been doing this for a while, I've been looking at other investors and I think that's about right. Okay, so if you make 10 investments, some of them are gonna be not very successful, some completely not successful, some will be okay-ish, and there will be one real star per every 10 you invest, okay? So every investor who's thinking about less than 10 startups is really, really risking it, okay? So if you are a startup and you're going to take money from this wealthy individual, and you know that this wealthy individual is gonna do three investments, be ready that if the things are not going so great, you'll have a lot of pressure because you're just one in three, so you'll get a lot of attention and there will be a lot of kind of risk and weight associated with you. Now, if you're an investor, really think this through, okay? Because, you know, you're, chances are any one given startup is not gonna be successful as it is. It's difficult out there, okay? Maybe it will make a lifestyle, maybe a small company, but not necessarily a big company, all right? So you wanna expose yourself, maybe with lower stake. Maybe don't be so aggressive on your negotiations. You wanna expose yourself to a lot of companies, okay? And the way you do this, which I'll return later in the presentation, the way you do this is up front you tend to give smaller investments, all right? So you distribute your risk. If you, you know, if you have half a million dollars, you wanna divide it equally, half and half, and a quarter of a million, you wanna give it to 10 companies. So very, very small checks. It's a discovery. And then you discover that one which you believe in the most, where the team is strongest, and you give that one the other quarter of a million. That way, chances are you'll make more money and you'll save more money. All right, so if you're in this long term, you should do this you know, on a fairly continuous basis. If you say, look, I'm having, you know, I'm doing this good in my career, I'm making profits, so I should be backing five to 10 startups every year or every season. All right, if you approach an investor who doesn't have this attitude, be prepared that there's gonna be a lot of crisis management once the portfolio is not doing so well. So this is very important for bo both ends. If you're an investor, you wanna, you know, it's okay if you said, look, I'm only gonna do this for two or three years, then I'm gonna close it and I'm gonna wait. That's all right. You know, so you say, okay, I'm gonna invest in maybe five this year, five next year, five the year after that, and then that's it. My portfolio is done and, you know, I'll, I'll wait what happens. So if that's not the approach, then, you know, be prepared for some tough times and really uncomfortable situations when one in three startups doesn't go so well, all right? The wait time is a lot longer. You know, we read in the news, the startup just raised a billion and sold to Facebook. We read this all the time. What we don't read, we don't read about the next 10,000 startups, which were really long time in the making. Um, a quote, who knows GoPro cameras? GoPro camera? Come on guys, you, most of you know GoPro cameras, all right? So they really made it big in about six years and they kept growing from there, right? And upon this six years 
anniversary, five or six, I can't, I can't be exactly certain. They, they made this huge trip for the company, they, they went skiing, so on and so forth, they've recorded a promo video, we're really having fun, okay? And founder of the company said, we were an overnight success because they launched a good marketing campaign that really drove the sales, not, technically not overnight, but in a very short period of time, right? So we said, we were overnight success, six years in waiting, okay? So they were preparing for that success for six years. They were investing in technology. So, so not all startups are like that, but almost with all startups, you have to wait for five to nine years before they really sell well, okay? So if you're new to the game, if you're an investor, you know, think about what your mindset will be in one and two and three years. Because as you can see, you will be not even halfway through, okay? So if two years down the line, you'll start pressuring the companies, where are the results? When are you gonna sell? I want my TechCrunch article about you, you know? If that's kind of, you know, think about it. A lot of investors end up with this, you know? They start, okay, I have patience. I'm a businessman, I know how this goes. I give the money, I wait for half a year, I wait for a year, you know, I'm tolerant. But when the second year comes, now there has to be, you know, where are the exits? Show me the money. You know, my traditional company, the sales went up 25% last year, okay? Where have you gone? Oh, well, we developed the product, we have early traction, we're talking to next stage investment. Come on, guys, sell it. So if you're an early stage investor, really think this through. What's your mindset gonna be in three, four, five years, not just at the beginning? Now, if you're a startup, make sure you package this correctly for investors. If you say, if you come to the investor and say, we are the best thing that ever happened to you. Next year, you're gonna be super rich, bathing in money, okay? You know, you know, we're the next Facebook, this is the thing. One year later, chances are you're not the next big thing, but maybe you're success in waiting, okay? But the investors say, you told me, you told me you're gonna make me a lot of money. So where's the money, right? So you wanna package this correctly. You wanna say, look, we have this huge perspective, but it will come in time, all right? We'll make victories, we'll make victories next year, and the year after, and the year after, and we really make your money back in about five years, or slightly later down the line. So you have to, uh, you have to kind of invest as well. And now, how much money should you invest? Okay? Uh, let's say one has a good house, maybe a few properties, a villa, something else, a few flats, maybe a few cars. Maybe owns his own company that makes a healthy profit margin, say 15% of profit every year, and has few kids that has to go through college. Maybe here, maybe in the US, all right? How much money does one need before one invests into something else? We're, we're talking million here, right? At least a million dollars, if, depending on how expensive the cars and the houses. We, it could be a few million. And only on top of that, only on top of that, the investment portfolio starts. And what does it start with? financial instruments, right? Bonds, shares, derivatives, pension funds, all of that, okay? So as an investor, you don't wanna overexpose to startups because really this is very, very risky. And if you wanna maintain a healthy relationship with your investments, you should not invest more than 5% of your investment portfolio. Right? So once you bought all the flats and you set your kids to college and you have all these fancy cars and maybe a plane, then you, know, then you invest in shares and then in startups. If you're really courageous and you want to lose all your money really fast, you can invest 10%. Never above this threshold. Above this threshold, either you're a pro at this game, which chances are not yet, or, you know, or you're, it's really risky. So from investor point of view, okay, it's your money. Do whatever you want. You, you want to live the life? Go ahead. But from startup point of view, this is make or break. If you are a startup and you meet this guy or a lady with the flats and kids and everything, but let's say just that, and they have an extra $100,000, just this. They say, I'm gonna give you 75. Good deal. Don't take the money. It's his or hers last available investment money. If the business goes well, great. I mean, the, the investor's business. But if it's not going so well, you're gonna be face a lot, of, a lot of pressure. I kind of need the money back kind of sooner. What can you do? Can, can I sell the company? Can you do more sales? M maybe we can move this to debt. Maybe you can pay me back. Or maybe you wanna sell my share to somebody else. And you know, half of the time, you'll be managing stakeholders 
and solving their financial problems rather than running your own business. So really, no matter how sexy the deal, if this is, you know, if you're going above this magical threshold for the investor as a startup, do the responsible thing. You know, save your own nerves and save the person's family. Don't take the money. Okay? And whenever you're going in this game, I'm sorry if I'm being too pessimistic, okay? I'll try to throw in a few jokes, but this is the experience, okay? So, uh, yeah, but the last pessimistic note here is there is a chance that no money will be made, okay? Stories happen. You know, you do one startup, you get your money 100 times back. I can't really heard it like that, but I suppose it exists, right? But more stories are, I made three investments and all of them were failures. That, that's what I hear, and all around Europe and slightly further, and I read about it. So once investment is made, make sure you kind of write down the money mentally. I kind of lost this, and then let's see what happens, because this is money at risk. This is the maximum risk category. It doesn't get much riskier than that, all right? So as an investor, you have to have that mentality. You, you, you can take this risk, you know? You don't have it leveraged, your, the bank doesn't own your home and that sort of thing. Now, as investor, sorry, as startup, you have to ask this question, okay? Very early on, you've just convinced the investor to give you the much needed money, congrats. Then you go back to investor and say, look, what happens if all of this goes south and there is nothing to give you back, okay? Now the next, one of two things can happen next. The investor will say, that's my mindset. I have accept this, let's go further. You know, let's venture together. Or investor will say, wait a minute. If you say so, then maybe I don't wanna, oh look, we have birds joining us. Hi there. So if investor doesn't accept the zero returns, and uh, yeah, I'm speaking too, too long, right? Can we please get the slides back? Anyway, if the investor doesn't accept this, you're better off. You're better off. And I've had this. At one point, I raced for that accelerator I told you about. And I came to these really active investors I knew. Like, also, we were friends. I said, would you give me money for my accelerator? And some of them said yes, and some of them said no. But those who said yes, I mean, uh, OK, so what happens if I don't give you your money back? And then some of them turned around and said, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not gonna invest then, okay? We're back. So I had friends and colleagues back out of a deal when I told them there is no money returned. And I'm very happy I did because now we're still friends. You know, I sit down, they consider some of my companies that is not such a problem. You know, had they taken, and it was it a little bit tougher than we had imagined, the, the relationship, the investment, everything would be in jeopardy. And the board meetings, you know, the, the really important meetings, those would be pretty uncomfortable. You promised us, we believed in you, so on. So you have to sell the zero returns before you sell the big returns. All right, so how do angels find startups? And first, I'll tell this for investor perspective, and then I'll turn back to the startups of you. Okay, there we go. Hmm? We start with the fact, how many startups should you look at? And these are pretty, pretty stark statistics, okay? Really good accelerators, like the US Techstars and Y Combinator, they look at thousands of applications. Yes, they recycle between the programs and between the cycles, but they look at thousands, at least a couple thousand. In some extreme cases, five to 6,000, okay? In Europe, we have a slightly slower market. I'd say on average, accelerator looks into Accelerator being an example of early stage investor. Looks at about two, 300 startups before they make their decision. And then they invest in a bunch of them. Some in five, some in 10, then in some extreme cases up to 40. But really more likely between eight and 10, okay? So we get the statistics. It's around less than 3% definitely. If you're a good accelerator in Europe, you'll get almost 1,000 applications. You'll back maybe at 10, so it's around 1%. All right, so this is a lesson to every angel that if you are looking at less than that amount of opportunities, chances are you'll make less money. Think about the angels you know if you do, okay? Angel investors, individuals, what do they do, you know? They maybe show up at a conference and they go past certain booths, pick up maybe 20 contacts, 20 is a lot. You know, probably they have to spend two days 
talking to to kind of really get a feeling of them. Most likely they ask around, they have their personal network, they have the colleagues, and they hey, send me deals. And they get deals, maybe 50. That's a good case, all right? Then the word gets around that this guy is kind of investing. And over a period of a year, slightly more deals come. They're like, oh, we heard you're looking for deals, blah, 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 you know, here's all this. Rarely these exceed 100, okay? Very rarely. A lot more often, this stays at 20, 25, okay? And then they make a choice of one, maybe five startups. If you're doing this, again, you're doing the roulette, all right? You wanna be closer to these kind of European average, et cetera. So you wanna look at two, 300 cases before we make a decision. And the kind of conversion, how many I've looked at to how many I invested, should be below 3%. Ideally, it's at 1%. That's, where you're, that's when you're really doing your homework, okay? So if you're a startup, this is bad news, okay? You're always at competition with 300 other guys. Don't worry. The good news is 90% of them suck. So you're only really at competition with the top 10%. And some of them will get funded elsewhere. So it's not as bad as it sounds. But, you know, you want to look at yourself and ask, who am I? Do I really outperform? You know, do I have a presentation? Is it a 21st century presentation? Can, you know, if I listed no competition, can investor find competition on Google's first page search? Those sort of questions, you know. And if the answer is the right way, then, you know, you have a decent chance with angels to do this less or more. Where do they find the deals? And or rather, how to drive these big numbers? Apologies. Uh, if you're an investor, right, you can look at, uh, sorry, you want to, okay, anyway, I'll just roll. They'll tell me something else. All right, so if you're an investor and you want to get these 300 deals, it's not so easy, right? Maybe in some cases, not so much. If you can define a focus and say, this is what I do. I'm going to be investing only in these countries, only in these sectors, and maybe with some sort of additional value drivers, then you will see more and more uh, deals coming your way. Let's say you say, I'm only going to do marketplaces, and I'm only going to pick these two countries. And the marketplace is preferable, they would sell something online, like software, or the other way around, food and clothing. All right? So ultimately, the world, the world will get around that you do marketplaces and food, and you will start seeing these deals. Moreover, as an investor, you can then start and build your own competence. You can talk to other marketplaces. You can talk to suppliers, partners, investors in that field. So you get a sense of what marketplaces and food, for instance, need, all right? So when a startup comes to you, you have a much more mature conversation, and then you can throw good arguments. Look, if I invest in you, I can connect you to these five super players, and I know how this works, and this works, and this works, and I've done five others like this before, all right? So as a startup, what you wanna, as a startup, what you wanna make, make sure is that this investor actually does this type of investments. And, uh, but that, if it's like he does everything, chances are he'll be able to help you with very, very little things. If he does something specific, then probably you'll be able to, uh, to get a lot of help from that. All right, so I'm gonna speed it up from here. Everyone cool with that? What is the most important thing when making an investment? And what's the most important thing to show? There are five things that count in a startup. Okay, the idea, the team, the team, the team, and the team, okay? So, I'd rather look at the team and skip the presentation, but not everyone like that, so have the presentation. But either your team sells or you're not. And what's important in a team? Again, five things. So, complementarity, the leader, the leader, the leader, and the leader, okay? So when you come there, that's what you sell. I'm the right man, I know what I'm doing, I'm on top of my game, you know, I lead the team, and your money is safer with me than with you. That's what you tell them. And if you have this confidence in yourself, and if you instill this confidence in investor, then that's what they buy. Okay, I give you the money. You know, you can come out like, the market is kind of crazy, but I'm the crazy market guy, and I can drive this. So as an investor, you look for this, as as a startup, you sell this. Where do angels look for? You know, 
if you don't know where to generate deal flow, conferences is a good place. But also, you can look if there are other angel groups, associations, business, business angel networks, that sort of thing. You can look if there are any accelerators, regional, you know, you can grow, go broad here a little bit because like, startups from your country go to these other accelerators. So you'd be surprised, you know, so expand your focus. Or you can talk to other angels. So if you're a startup and you want to lit up on the radar, radar, you do the same. You maybe pick the most visible accelerator, maybe you pitch to business angel network groups, and then you kind of ping a lot of angels. All right, uh, one new thing that I've started doing recently is that you identify as an investor, you identify founders, because this is the key element, the leaders, right? The team members, leaders, you identify them in a community, maybe some of them are here, right? Doesn't matter if, you're, if they're raising money, doesn't matter if they're working on a startup, you identify them. The longer the list, the better. And you sim somehow stay in touch with them. Maybe you write a newsletter, maybe you read a newsletter, maybe you invite them for a coffee. And that's the best quality deal flow generator, all right? So if you have 50 people like that on your radar, chances are some of them will come to you for investment in a period of a year, okay? So this is a long-term view. It doesn't give you short results, but it gives you quality in the end. And again, as a founder, you basically you want to friend number of angel investors. So the earlier you prepare this, if you start working with this even before you start working on your startup, chances are by the time you need money, you'll have the kind of confidence in the relationship. So the fundraising will be pretty quick. Agreeing on investment. This is quite technical, so I understand how that some of you might fall asleep during this part. But I'm going to quickly brush by and see if I can tell you something useful about it. Okay? So... That's what I say, the team is the most important thing. And I'm speeding up here. If you want me to slow down at some particular point, just raise your hand and ask a question. So, you know, investors should make sure that the team is there and it's functioning and leader leads and everything. What I tell investors is that there should be a legal safeguard that the team has an agreement between them. It's called shareholders agreement, it's quite popular. But a lot of the times, shareholder agreement governs the relationship between the team and the investor kind of safeguards or whatever, pressure points, doesn't matter. What I say, make sure the agreement actually agrees between the founders. So you do the marketing, you do the product, you do investor relationships. And then there are certain KPIs, okay? By marketing, we mean 20% growth every month. Okay, maybe 10%. Uh, less, if it's less than that, you're out. Okay, if you do product, there is also a roadmap. Technology has to be in place in four months, in six months, whatever, updates, some sort of KPIs. If you do investors as well, we have certain homeworks done, we have certain investor connections, and we raise money by the end of the year. All right, so you set these KPIs. And if people leave, you also assign safeguards. So as an investor, you want to make sure that this happens. As a founder, probably you also want, of course your team is the best team, of course your friends, probably been friends for a while. But chances are, over the next two years, one of you will leave. You know, some good things happen, great job, another start, a marriage, whatever. Some bad things happen. Burnouts, tired, wrong product, that sort of thing. So someone will leave, granted. Very, very rarely does the full team stay together for a few years. Make sure you agree beforehand what happens then. Because what happens usually is you raise a, a little bit of money, then one of them leaves and says, look, the company is now one million, okay, and I have 10% of shares, give me $100,000. Uh, $100, and there is no such money. And as a leader, you feel, well, you're our marketing. If you leave, we're out of marketing. So you should be paying me because we'll be in trouble. You're, you know, you're betraying the team, you know, and then you have a huge, huge debate. Often, this means a lot of money going to the leaving partner, and uh, that's not good for the business, as it is. So what do you want to say? If you leave in the first six months, you're going to get $1, because it's super risky. If you leave in the next six months, maybe you'll get the book value. We all know what the book value will be around there. So uh, yeah, the same dollar. If you leave in the next six months, we'll give you your share of EBITDA. EBITDA being the share of profit, right? And how much is that going to be? Also close to $1. If you're making sales, you're in month number 14, you're making sales, chances are EBITDA can be a little bit, and then maybe you give you $1,000. So and only maybe after a couple of years or so, say, if you leave then, then maybe we give you a discounted value of the last deal. So if it's a million, you have 10%, so we give you maybe 70000 for your exit. And this has happened, but this is two, two, three years down the line. 
So and obviously there, it's much more complicated, but this is the basic principle. As an investor, you want to have this. As a founder, you want to think about this, especially if you're the leader, chances are you're going to stay when other people leave. So even if they're your best friends, which is probably not the right people to do business with, do it with professionals, not with friends. Keep friends for friendship. All right. Mm. Very quickly. Uh, don't bother on agreeing very detailed business plan. It's going to change every month, sometimes every day, OK? So let's just agree we're going to go in Thailand, and we're going to do this sector, and maybe we change this once per year. You know, stay at a high level. What kind of investment did it is? For investors, it's always better to do direct equity with certain safeguards. I know I'm not popular. All Silicon Valley is now doing bonds, so why the hell I'm saying direct equity? With direct equity, you get the best multipliers. In angel investment, the first jump in money uplift tends to be the biggest. So the startup comes to you, you give them money, maybe the valuation half a million or so, sometimes less, sometimes more. The next time they raise money, chances are it's a VC, the valuation will be a million or plus, you'll get several times the multiplier. Often after that, you only get percentage increases. So you want your base multiplier to be as high as possible. Hopefully that makes sense, it's really technical. As a founder, therefore, you want the opposite. You want to give a convertible, okay? So basically you say the next round is going to be around 1 million, I don't know what it's really going to be, I'm going to give you a discount of 20 to 30% from that round and that's what you get, you know? So depends on who's stronger, you know, is it the star investor with lots of people around this door or are you the star entrepreneur, you get what you want, all right? And there is this model of debt, very popular around the world, never do it, okay? <laughs> Kills the company. Trenching, this is also very popular with investors who don't trust themselves. I'm sorry to say so. Uh, basically say, look, kind of, I kind of like where you're going, but I'm not sure. You know, you're not really that cool guy and there's a lot of you know, uncertainty down the road. So I'm gonna give you half a million, but I'm gonna give you 100,000 now and 100,000 maybe in, in, in half a year and then half a year and half a year and half a year, but you'll have to make certain mile, milestones wait. And obviously they never happen because, you know, at best you'll hit 80% of the target, chances are you'll pivot down the way, okay? So program conflict. If you're an investor and you're not sure if this is how you feel, like so many things, have, don't give such a big check. So it's 100,000, we negotiate it. If you need more money, we're back to negotiations after half a year after you spend the 100,000. Yeah, as an entrepreneur, this kind of, you feel like you raise half a million, you tell everyone, you tell the press, but in practice you raise 100,000. And once you need the next 100, you're back to the same negotiations anyway. So you make your investor feel better, right? close the smaller amount. Yeah, so this is the thing I've told you about, uh, about kind of my experience in Europe. I'm gonna very briefly explain this, and then we're gonna go forward with the rest of the stuff. Okay, so in my corner of Europe, I see startups raising nearly a million euros, so it's about the same in dollars, before they go to a capital center, which in Europe is London, and they raise their next big round. So before they really hit five million plus valuations and start raising their rounds in their millions, they typically go through about two to three stages. They will go to someone very early and raise maybe as little as 25,000, closer to 50 most of the time, and then they will top it up by increasing rounds. They will do maybe 150 to 150 in the next round and you know several hundred thousand in the next round before they're ready with the technology, ready with the product, ready to go to London in our cases. So here I assume, at least for some of you, the ladder should be you raise with an angel, then you top it up with angel, angels, or local VCs, and then you go to a capital center, which I assume is the US market, at least for some of you. If it, this doesn't make sense, just be aware that in Scandinavia, this is what happens. All right, this is again very legal and very technical. Just two main messages here. Uh, some investors like to do diligence on technology, waste of time, okay? You're gonna be investing very little amount of money, let's say 25,000 euros or 50,000 euros, okay? Be mindful of your own transaction costs. If you'll take it out of the investment, you're taking the fuel out of the rocket, okay? If you'll be paying yourself for a technology expert, then you'll be, you'll be kind of expanding your risk. 
You do 50,000 and you invest another seven on consultancy. It's really, you know, exposes your risk by 20% more. Early stages, especially software, right? It's not good before they have written it three times over, okay? So if you will look at the code, it will be crap. So, you know, if you want, call me, I'll tell you it's crap without looking at it, and you know, that will save you a few thousand dollars in due diligence. Don't bother. That was message number one. Message number two, it always takes time. There is always buts. I can't leave my day job because I have a bank loan or because I have kids at home. I can't leave my day job because I really like day job. I can't do this, I can't do that. Uh, you know, one of the founders is in this remote location and he's not coming over. Many reasons. There will always be special situations. There are no clean cut startups. This is a perfect startup with a perfect deal, okay? Very, very rarely you get this up front. So this will always take time, okay, I need to think about this. Let's meet again next week. Let, let, let's give this to the lawyers. Let's, let's let them put it in writing. They come back in a week or two, sometimes in a month, but change your lawyer. You know, they, they come back in a couple of weeks and it's, the wording is completely different. You know, you had different ideas. You start over again. Then you give preconditions. Okay, we're gonna give you the money, but you go establish a company. You make this, you make that. You transfer the website, you register a trademark, something like that. It takes time. Never less than six months. You know, in the most excited of cases I've seen, where everyone gets to the table, we love each other, let's do this, we know from each other, you know, let's sign today, money's ready in the bank account, three to four months. The lawyer's getting ready, the butts, then all of a sudden, by the way, I have another company like this. You know, we really wanna go ahead with this, but you know, I, I kind of like, I'll be stepping down, but I'll keep my shares. Hmm, there is a conflict, yeah, yeah, but I'm telling you about it. Let, let, let's let lawyers decide all the time, okay? So as a founder, from day one, you start talking to investor, it will take you six months to get his money, proper. You know, if he'll just give you without the contract, you're screwed, because he's probably gonna send the hitman after half a year. So you want the contract, right? So, and the contract takes time and blah, 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 blah. So if you think, today we have the beginning of May, right? I have my month names right. So if you think you'll need money in September, you're kind of screwed. You know, think about something else. Best you can do is maybe December, but then it's Christmas or January. So you have a little bit of time to talk to a number of investors, which usually takes another half a year, by the way, and then you'll have about half a year to negotiate. Yep, moving forward. Uh, these are general things you see in VC contracts, and I advise angels also to have them. But, you know, as a founder, think about what it means, and, you know, find a compromise. Pick your battles. Don't try and take down all of them. Uh, very quickly, from a founder point of view, this sounds like hell of a nerve, okay? Uh, I'll take part of your company, maybe a big part. Uh, I, will be, I will not dilute, so my share will stay the same throughout the next investment round. Uh, if we sell the company, I get my money first back, no matter what the value. Okay, I give you 100,000, we sell for 100,000, I get 100,000, you get nothing. That's one time liquidation preference. Some people do two times liquidation preference, or even three times. So I give you 100,000, you sell for 250, 200 for me, 50 for you. That's what investors do all the time. Tag along, drag along, I decide to sell my shares, you have to sell as well, okay? This happens. So, you know, you like it or you don't, put option, I come back and say, you buy my shares. Okay, I say it should, it should be one euro, like one dollar. That's fair, that's the fail safe, you know. If I don't like you anymore, I don't want to do anything, I tell you buy my shares for one dollar. Some investors put full amount here. I don't like you anymore, give me my 100,000 back. I've seen contracts like that, quite a lot of them. I want reporting. Call me every week, write me every month. I want these huge papers all the time. I can request audits anytime I want. I want the board. No major decision without me being there in written saying I approve of this. Uh, I want you to come up all your legal. This is just fraction of regular VC contract. It sounds terrible, right? Some of this you can fight back. Some of this you can make normal, but not all of it. So as a, VC, as a founder, I always see, if I can say so, I always see this WTF moment. They get this contract and you must be joking, you know, you're taking over my soul. And, uh, you know, be prepared, know these things, read up about them in advance, pick your fights, win some of them. As an angel, 
think about your reputation here as well, okay? I've seen in my part of geography, I see some investors being very, very aggressive with this. As a result, the strongest founders don't even call them. Only the desperate ones go with, okay, we heard you're aggressive, but we really need the money. So, you know, we're, we have a failing startup, but we'll give you aggressive terms. You don't want that, okay? So, you want the moderate clause. You want to protect yourself. This is why these are here, right? You're protecting your money. So go ahead and protect them. But, you know, make it fair for the founders. Maybe put option is one, pro, uh, per, uh, $1. Maybe drag only works if the founder sells, okay? Maybe liquidation is just one times liquidation if they sell, and so on. Maybe not so much reporting. You know, moderate. What you can accept. How well you know these guys. How, how much do you trust them? So that way, you know, they come back and say, look, I've, I've shown a really good deal with this individual. I advise the rest of you also come to him. It's good for a reputation, karma, pipeline, and many other things, as well as a relationship with the founders down, one year down the line. But put option, always do a put option, at least one dollar. If it's not going well, and we already agree that this statistically it will not go well, you want out of it as quick as possible. You send a notification, give me the one dollar, and bye-bye. Yeah, I kind of spoke about due diligence. I'm speeding up a little bit here so we meet the schedule and then you have time for questions. What happens after investment, okay? In short, some of my friends raised money from some of the best brands in Europe. And I asked, what do those investors help you with? You know, what makes them great? Only two things. Strategic advice and connections. They go to board. They only talk about high-level topics. They don't talk about, you know, your marketing campaign went out with wrong wording or wrong color. The website is not up to standard. What, what have you been doing last week? I think your sales guy is on the wrong system. They don't do this, okay? The best guys. You have to trust the team. And if, if you don't trust the team, if it's not strong enough, the company is dead anyway, right? So, you know, pick the right people, place trust in them, discuss, you know, when are we going to another market? Is it this year? Is it this quarter? What is the first next market? Why the next market is the next market? You know, try to give input as well. You have to be the professional. All right, I know that market very well. And therefore, if you go there, I can really give you connections there. But if the other market makes more sense, go ahead and do it, but I will just, you know, I'll be a backseat driver and I'll sit and, you know, comment. And connections, obviously. The more relevant connections you have, the better you do. That's your value drivers as investor. Not control, not oversight, not hands-on approach, not working together. Those are swear words. The more experienced founder, the less he wants it. Okay? As a startup as well. Smart money is dead. Okay? If somebody say, look, I don't give just money. I'm smart money. I'm going to sit in your office. I'm going to help you with everything. Thank you. Bye-bye. You know? You say, okay, you want an investor who says, I'm really successful, therefore I'm really busy. So we have one hour a month. You'd better come laser sharp to that meeting, and you only ask me questions I can help you with. That, you know, that's the kind of situation you want. Obviously, real life is not like this, and compromises happen. Reporting is very important, okay? Uh, managing your investors, and as an investor knowing what your startups do, is absolutely key. Now, you want reporting that gives you full picture, but you don't want your founders working on reports, right? So you want a system where they use three to four hours a month on reporting, tops, and then they spend on their business, but you get a full picture. The way I recommend doing this, Real-time dashboards of business KPIs, you, you, know, you identify what it is, and you, you have it real-time available. I, this is an example. I'm sorry it's blurred. It's not your eyes. This is, a, this is a real example, so that's why it is. Basically, you can see the columns are months. You can see a little bit colors there, so it's going good or bad. And then there are key KPIs, right? So mostly, it's new users, new customers, revenue and costs, okay? And then there are many ways to look at this. Returning, churning, conversions, blah, blah, blah. You want to see it all, you know? But it has to be automated, so you can look at it in the middle of the night, on a weekend, whenever you want, and you don't have to call the founder. So that's one, that's the report, and obviously, yeah, you want some sort of a monthly status. 
You can do it live, you can do it by email. There are some things you want to do, you want to know about. Mostly, how do you get new customers and how much they pay you and how the technology is going around. Mostly three things, right? And that's about it. And that's what I say. Sorry if you want to take a picture. Right. So th that's basically what, what I say. What I say over there, I say, yeah, you want to see, you know, total, totals. Customer acquisition cost, lifetime values, that sort of thing. You know, there are other businesses with other important KPIs. That's what I want to see. You want to see the summary in the newsletter, or maybe in a monthly meeting. You wanna, you wanna see it's in dashboard. That's one. Now, on the other side, that's what I said. You know, you, you, the top investors offer this high-level contribution. Now, try and avoid drive-by mentorship. Okay. Founder lives in his business 24/7, so 10 months down the line. The founder is very knowledgeable about what he does, okay? If it's two years down the line, the person is probably an expert in the area. If you are running a different business, don't second guess the calls and board meetings. It's drive-by mentorship, you know. Somebody comes in and says, look, I've been thinking really hard about this for the last quarter of a year. And I think we should go with this strategy because the competition, because the market, because our customers, so on. Mm, doesn't sound good. I feel better with the other plan. Happens all the time. It do, they don't say it like this, okay? Founders are typically, whenever they want to change something, they're not that convinced about themselves. So they come, I was kind of thinking about switching things around. They know that pivots is a bad word with investors, so they say it's alteration to the strategy. And, you know, it's packaged very neatly and it's not so sure. And then investor feels like, this is my opportunity to give this strategic advice. No, 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 I think the other thing is better. Stay with the course, focus is king. This is what happens, this happens in boards all the time. So as an investor, you wanna lay back and think, okay, if he's bringing this to me in a board, this must be important. You can challenge a little bit, you know, have you done the cal calculations? Have you looked into, into specifics? Have you got customer feedback, that sort of thing? If you're doubting. But if the founders are smart, chances are all of that is done, okay? So as a founder, don't just accept throwbacks. Try to push back, like saying, okay, thank you. I hear your point. I'll think about it. But me, I'm the man in charge. You know, you'll hold me accountable to give you your money back. And I feel that's the right direction. In worst case, make sure you at least talk it over in detailed level. So here's the stats, here's the assumptions, here's the kind of background information. Do you still think that? Well, as an investor, you want to avoid that. And you want to avoid hand-holding, okay? Early on, you feel that the person is not very strong, okay? So you help him. You should now call this guy, you should call that guy, you should get that guy on board. You kills the teams. The moment you stop doing this, the moment the progress stops because Entrepreneurship is a hard thing to do. And even if a person has succeeded in this before, first time most likely it wasn't luck, okay? So before this becomes a process, because before this becomes a repetitive track record, the person needs to develop this. Experiment, make a lot of mistakes, pick up from all of them, pick something right. You can't do this for another person. This is completely experience-based learning that no school will teach you, only making mistakes out there in the field. If you handhold them, if you make decisions for them, even if you know what the right decision is. If you make the decisions for them early on, they won't develop the skills, and when the stakes get bigger, they'll start making bigger mistakes, and that is very likely to kill the team, the company. Uh, yep, some examples of what KPIs and tracking were a little pressed on time. So basically, I'm just gonna say, as a founder, you have to know two or three of your metrics really well, you have to track them live, you have to have a lot of stats on them, and you have to, have, you have to be able to answer several depths, uh, layers of depth on why. We track this because it's important, it's like this because we're doing this, and we're doing this because our users told us so, or because the technology is developing and that, so on and so, so forth. So I'm not gonna go into deeper, there are a couple of examples here. All right, so, situations happen all the time, okay? Best off, you start by getting the best people on board, okay? So a best leader is someone who hires stronger persons than he is. So if it's a student with his student group because they study together, chances are the team is dead. Probably later than sooner, but that's what it's gonna look like. 
if it's a young aspiring person but managed to convince two or three senior people, at least one, to join the team, that's already a good sign. If it's already an experienced person, then you'll see that the team is completely different. He added a couple of youngsters for their enthusiasm and because they're cheap, let's face it. But then the other guys are actually their former peers, former colleagues, really strong guys. So that's kind of the best measure to avoid problems in the future. Now, if the company is doing not so well, I mean, if it's stagnating for a while, chances are that's it. As an investor, you forget it. I've seen companies come back after a year. Yeah, you said like, you're on your own. You know, I feel like this is going nowhere. You want to work on the company? Go ahead, but you know, you'll feel free to call me for advice, but you know, we stop doing this monthly thing, so on. I'm gonna give you like one hour and a quarter. And nine out of 10 will completely go away and die miserably and one out of 10 will come back. But if you see this happening, you know, don't waste your time going back to entrepreneur, but there's something else you can do. Maybe merge with another team, maybe invite new people, maybe a little bit more money at very bad terms and so on. Mostly this kills your time and your money and also kills entrepreneurship in the person. You know, so if, you, if it's not going so well, you, you said, okay, we're gonna give this 12 months, typically more than 12 months is not not very good idea. So you give 12 months for everything and you say, okay, if it's not going so well after 12 months, well, you know, go on on your own or maybe we should stop the whole thing. Okay, mentoring is what I meant about uh, no drive-by. Now going international, this is very important. I think the best startups, you know, the real successes that are out there, go to other markets. Now Thailand is a big country. There are a lot of users here. So I understand that a lot of startups might, might wanna stay in the market for, for a while. Make sure you do pilots in a market or markets that make sense early on. Make sure you have that mentality because once you start thinking about other than your home market, your approach to marketing and you know channels, that changes and you start to get much more methodical about it, which is what you want. Okay, a lot of you are looking at your watches so I, I speed it up. Lesson here, uh, if investor has several startups and uh, he has invested small amounts into them, you can see money at risk is 120,000, let's say dollars. The, the, the numbers are the same. If that's what the exposure, and you're one of the startups, this is what the upside looks like. Basically, if you're in the red, if you sell for that amount of money, you've killed the entire portfolio. If you're in the blue, you did not outcompete banks and other financial instruments. If you're in the yellow, you're kind of there, but you're not the success story. Only if you're in the white, you're the success story. So, point here is, chances are, your exit is gonna be the only exit that's gonna pay back for the entire portfolio of the investor. If you want your investment to be a success story, you have to understand this and you have to help the investor to make his portfolio successful by yourself being a lot kind of the most successful. And by this I mean up there we have the valuation at which you have to sell your company and down here we have how many years you have. You can see at about six years, it becomes near the impossible unless you get a 100, 100 million valuation, okay? If you're going for 100 million and you're realistic about it, that's cool. If you only see that number on paper and more realistically you see, you know, I know how to build this to $10 million company or 15 million, and at that point, I will either need to hire a new CEO who's done these things before or I will need to sell, okay? So let's say you're gonna sell that 14 million, okay? You see, you have three to four years to get there and sell, else you're not gonna make the portfolio work for your investor. So if you sold it for, I don't know, 34 million, after 10 years or so, an investor is not smiling, you know, it's loads of money. I really did it. We went through, through funding rounds, we built the company, Google has bought us. What's the problem? And yeah, but I would have made the same money, minus all the nerves, if I had I invested in a simple instrument in a bank. Okay, so for angels, you know, this is uncomfortable truth, and you think about this when making the next investment for entrepreneurs, know that this is what it feels like in angel portfolio, and try to, you know, game the numbers. Be the one that was gonna make all the money back for your investor, that way you'll be a star, he'll give you money again, you'll, you know, you'll do careers long after this together. Quickly for the angels, you know, Try to do follow-ups for the leaders because that's what they need. I've told about this number of stages approach, but uh, package everything in your mind, in your Excel and in your bank account, package it into portfolios. You've done 10 startups, they invested against each other. Don't build a portfolio of 100 startups, then you will never know if you're doing well or not. 
package them 10 by 10, even at least in your mind. These 10 has to pay for themselves, one of them will. These 10, these 10, if you do follow-ups and they're significantly bigger, like you invested 20,000 in everything and now you're gonna give somebody 200,000, obviously that skews the portfolio. Package the follow-ups into a separate portfolio. You have three portfolios, 10, 10, 10, of really small tickets, and you have one big portfolio of five follow-ups, okay? And that, each of these has to pay for itself. So the follow-ups have to, at least one of them has to pay for all follow-ups, and then these other things have to pay for themselves anyway. Uh, yep. Two messages here for investors. You know, if it's not going well, just write it down. It's gonna be a time killer. Again, 12 months, maybe slightly longer, put options help. Uh, explore secondary liquidity. So once you have a portfolio and you're, you have the skin in the game, you have 10 startups, you're second year, third year doing this, all right? You know how this goes. You want some of your money back. But startups, as we discussed, they're five years from exit. You can go to another angel who's just starting or another angel who have similar and say, hey, do you wanna buy into my portfolio? You'll get the experience, I'll take you to the board meetings. It's already balanced, so some of them are already doing good. You'll see the bad and the good. You know, and you'll risk less money. And then you can do the follow-ups on some of these. Sometimes this works. It's good for you as an investor because you get some of your money back, not at the premium, but at least you decrease the risk some way down the line. It's good for entry-level angels, in a way, not for everyone. Obviously, for entrepreneurs, this changes very little that I'm now more heads around the table and one of them is less experienced, so be mindful. Yeah. Message here, the next time you raise, you know, follow on after an angel, whatever, you need to talk to 50 investors. Five, zero, no exceptions. If you're talking less, you're doing it wrong. You'll get a shitty deal, I'm sorry for my language. You know, you, you, you have to, uh, if you talk to 10, one will be interested, probably. Out of several interested, they feel this competition. They lock you out, they have uh, no shop clauses in their term sheets, that sort of thing, because they don't want you comparing one against the other. That's how you win the battles. So look, you gave me three times liquidation preference and the other guy only gives me one. You have to go back down on it. Sounds very tough from the investor point of view, but if you're already in the startup, you tell them the same thing. I want you to get a good deal. So you go ahead and you talk to 50 investors, 50 VCs. I think this happens in US, in the rest of our countries, there simply isn't 50 venture capital funds that can do startups, right? I don't think there are 50 here, but you know, prove me wrong. In Europe, basically that means you have to go to London and six other cities, six other capitals to get this one. And that's what you do. You get on a plane, tickets are not so expensive, you travel, you meet them, you travel again after two months, and after again two months, you put them on a newsletter, you build the relationship, one year later, you get a good deal. This is how it is. So, you know, if you raise a small amount of money, you start with day one, at least with a plan. Here, I'm not that familiar with how many VCs in which market, but uh, the markets are joining, so chances are you'll have to do the same. You'll have to reach out to other ecosystems, and, you know, the target is 50. Anyone wants to ask something at this, but this is kind of backup section of the presentation anyway. I can tell you slightly more, but we're very pressed for time, so I'd rather take some of your questions here. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, cool. So, first of all, a mantra some of the investors I follow, VC investors, say is, you ask for money, you get advice. You ask for advice, you get money. So, first of all, try to approach investors asking for advice. Start the conversation going, show them how they're thinking, tap into their thinking, tap into their connections, only then start the money conversation. Kind of that's the, what the world turned to these days. It is what it is. If you don't want to get these, maybe we're interested in follow up for half a year, rather start a discussion and then ask for money. So that's one. Now, I've, uh, end of last summer, which was about eight months ago, I toured about 80 or 90 VCs in Europe. I went to their offices, all of them, many cities. 
I spoke to, and as a result from that, I think there is no such thing as smart money. This is a very, very dishonest industry. All these people, they look, I don't know, superstars, rock stars, fancy watches, clips, everything, you know, I'm cool. Talk to me, I'm smart money, everything. I've raised my fund, that's why I'm smart. That, that's the facade you get. But once you get the money, you get more hands-on control, you get uncertainty, they don't believe in yourself, they want trenching, they want bad contracts, that's what you get mostly. And only top segment, top funds actually bring this really good strategic advisor. So don't try to couple additional benefits with the investment. Rather say, okay, you're basically gonna give me money and you're gonna throw my, your opinion at me. I wanna limit the opinion actually, okay? Now that I buy mentorship, no hand-holding, we want the strategic level. And obviously you can't say this up front to an investor because that's never gonna happen, right? So you have to package the word. But I'm saying lower expectations and build safeguards. The typical investor can give you money and trouble via control, okay? So what you want to do is you want to take the money and you want to limit the control. Contract helps, negotiations helps, expectations. If you're looking for expertise that you don't have, find another way. Advisors, advisory board, industry insiders. In some cases where you have very, very specialized funds, they also bring very specialized expertise. That happens. That's the majority of funds. You want to follow up? Anyone has another question? Go ahead. Uh, very, very good point. I haven't touched on this. Frankly, I think unless you're, a, unless this is a sales strategy, PR is a waste of time. That's what I think. But investors tend to be very emotional. We spoke about that they are insecure, okay? What they like to hear the most is that another guy they know is about to give you money. Then they want to give you money too, right? So there is definitely an element of that if you come and say, I'm kind of, I'm the hype. Everybody's writing about me. And investors are lining up. Then it's good, then publicity is good. If it's only everybody's writing about me but nobody's calling me, then you're kind of in a very, very difficult spot, okay? We had a couple more questions here, sorry. Oh, yep, yep, cool. So startups will barrage you with questions about hires, always. We need to hire product, we need to hire marketing, we need to hire a developer. So if you have an access to a way they can hire, maybe you have a lot of headhunters as friends, or maybe you work with IT outsourcing companies and you have access to a lot of developers or something or something. So this is the first part, they will ask you. In my opinion, the best thing you can have as connections is uh, other founders, so you are either friend with founders who've done it before, serial entrepreneurs. Founder and founder learning is the best way to learn, I think, outside of learn by experience, okay? So either you have access to them because you friend them or you have access to them because you invested in them. Then you kind of have a right saying, look, you know, I helped you out in your early days, now come back here and help this other guy in the early days, like sit for two hours on the drawing board, tell him. So, Serial entrepreneurs is probably top of the list in the value. Another is then industry experts, all right? And in my corner of the world, product managers is completely scarce. Everyone who's any good, like developers you think is difficult, but product managers, there is very little of them, even less of them are good, and all of them have these top star jobs. You know, very, very little space to get it from. So if you have access to them, Let's do a weekend, you know, workshop. I'm throwing a barbecue at my place, but come over and so on. If you have the soft power of them that can really kind of uh, shine some light on how it's done early on, maybe it's another skill set here. Maybe it's architects, maybe it's marketing, maybe something else. But whatever is the scarcest, if you at least have to part-time access to that resource, that makes you really sexy as an investor. And then obviously investor connections. So. I, as an angel, I know a lot of funds, and some of them constantly get interest from me. So when one of my companies need to access, I can easily throw 10, 20, 50 intros 
to the fund. So for them, this becomes easier. We had a question here, sir. Uh, to what end? Do you want to become an investor or do you want to become a successful fundraiser? Uh, as an investor. Well, uh, obviously, there is always do first, do mistakes, which is very costly. Uh, okay, I think uh, I would try and get involved with uh, whatever the location is that has the high deal flow of interesting deals. So it could be incubator or accelerator, join as a mentor join as a, some sort of resident, you know, maybe offer them if you have a little bit of money to spare. Quite a lot of accelerators are very open to buy-ins. So you say, here's a small amount of money. I want a little bit of your accelerator, but then I want to deal with portfolio issues. I want to go to board meetings. You'll be hugely disappointed how difficult they are. And then, uh, you know, I want to I wanna wet the pipeline. I want to I wanna go to interviews when you make the next decision. This will probably very quickly jump you from whatever the access you have to pipeline now to slightly more established, maybe very good. Uh, and uh, beyond that, well, you know, you can always get mentorship. Try to talk to these founders, try to talk to these investors. But, you know, beyond this kind of get involved with wherever the deal happens and maybe befriend 10 serial entrepreneurs or five other angels, besides these two, two tools, I think it's just time and experience as with everything in life. Yeah, there's, the, we, uh, uh, maybe it's best if you do this afterwards because I think in several slides I actually touch on accelerators. But I'm, I'm happy to talk after this. Anyone else feels like having questions, sir? How many shares? Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, this is actually one of these backup slides that I have for, yeah, down there, you see? So, uh, sorry, apologies. No, no, the, sorry, that one after all. In the pre-seed stage, you have only the presentation, okay? So there's a fraction of investors that actually don't take shares, typically public, okay? But around a huge chunk of them, almost a third of investors take under 10% or 10%. Very rare, this is advanced angel level. They already done a number of these things before. Much more commonly, and this is a real survey from investors from end of last summer. Quite many investors on this one. Almost half of them tend to take, tend to take 10 to 20% more on the higher side and then a little bit on, on, on something else. Now, if we take later down the stage, you see in seed stage, which is probably what you wanna get, Truly half of them take about 10 to 20%. And this expands even further into Series A. So if you go into Series A, you definitely know you're in 10 to 20 range. And uh, you see 30 plus up there in Series A and B, those are special cases, really heavy investments, that sort of thing. Now, my rule of thumb is to start with a 15% target, okay? If you do better than 15%, you're doing really good. If you do worse than 15% and you make compromises, right? Depending on how good you're doing, if you're really, really going ahead or you need very little money, you can squeeze it you know, down to past 10, seven, five, whatever. Uh, I do with the small, small tickets, I do a lot of below 10 and even below five, but those are very small tickets, okay? So with regular size tickets, the one that really gets you places, you think about 15 as a target and then you see, am I stronger? And then you squeeze it down or actually the investor is stronger because I really need the money and then it goes up. And often it goes up in these uh, kind of more regular seed stages. Go ahead. No, this is actually completely from VC, but I, I'll, yeah. Yeah. no, no, no. Angels in Series A, I mean, Series A, I think a proper Series A is a million or more in investment. It has to be a very, very wealthy individual to be able, or a lot of angels. It happens, but rarely. Series A is a venture capital game. And, and the, the angels stay in there, and more, more 
Yeah, buy, buyouts doesn't happen that often. I mean, I've heard about some more PE, private equity funds, who just wanna, you know, if I'm in, I want my opinion and not yours. So either I get it by contract, but not many people want to sign it, or I clear the early guys. All sorts of advisors, early stages, but this happens rarely. Typically you stay on board, you live till the end, you get diluted, you get squeezed, no one listens to you. So it's, it's a little bit of a sad game, but you know, that's, what, that's, why you want, that's why you want equity early on. So you get a huge multiplier up to Series A, and then you let that, you know, float some a little bit. You get, you know, the value goes up, but you get diluted. So then, you know, hopefully you retain your initial multiplier, which is already sexy enough. And therefore, you can see, in the earliest of stages, most investors prefer equity, and then some others prefer. This is European market again, uh, because uh, in US it's a completely different game. And here, I'm just not that exposed. Sir, again. No, no, this, is, this shows the preference of investors. Okay, let me oh, explain okay. this a little bit. Okay. In series A, hopefully you can hear me, right? In series A, guys who want to take 15 to 30%, sorry, 10 to 20%, that's the bulk, right? It feels like 70%. So, sense And as for dilution, my experience is angel anti-dilution survives one round. Either you participate pro rata in the next round with your money, which means a lot of money putting in next to VC, and then you get your anti-dilution for one more round, or that's the last round you anti-dilute. Basically you say, I gave you 100,000, it gave me 10%, that stays, VC comes in, okay, so I'm gonna respect this once. We're gonna write over the new contract. We're gonna keep your 10% this time, but the next contract says you have no anti-dilution. So mostly, I think, anti-dilution of angel anti-dilution survives one round after they've done investment. So if you've done 25,000 and maybe 50,000, and then you come to Series A, say, okay, I'm gonna give 100,000 as part of Series A, next to maybe a big VC, just so I get my anti-dilution also in the next round. But also, once you get to Series B, it's an open game. You know, if a really good VC comes in and say, look, I don't care what your anti-dilutions are. These are my terms, everybody dilutes. Throw back your shareholders agreement, come back to me if you like it. Happens all the time. And you know, and most likely, you know, if this is really world brand and they're giving you like five million in Series B or 25 million in Series B, I think, you know what, forget it. You know, we're done with our anti-dilution. All right, I feel we're kind of out of time. So unless, last question. How flexible is the number or how flexible what? The number. So in practice, I see most startups doing less, less than 50. And in practice, most of them I see closing really, really tough rounds. So I'd say if you compromise on that because you don't know where to find them or you maybe just tired of flying around, then you basically accept the lower deal. And sometimes this is a compromise against time. You need the money tomorrow, which is plus six months, as I told you, right? So you kind of feel that you know, the runway is gonna run out and it's time to stop shopping and sit down and close the deal with one investor or a few investors. And that, then, then that's what you do. But if, if time is still open or if you're really efficient, like if you have a week or two to fly and you've kind of dedicated that in your yearly schedule, try and get this number and even try to surpass it a little bit, all right? Uh, another one last thing I'm gonna trouble you with. The gray section here shows how many of VCs only invest in their own country. So we see it gets lower with time, but in the early stages, nearly half of them, and I think in reality half of VCs only invest in their own country. So now after, out of 50, number of them will go to, you know, say you'll have to relocate. It's cool if that's California, but it's, you know, if it's somewhere else and that basically you're not getting the market you want, but you're moving out of your home market, it's a tough compromise. So 
you know, sometimes you say, okay, I'll take a worse deal, but I'll take it back home. And with that, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you for your full presentations. And due to the limited of time, I think all, you know, many of you have many doubts. So any channel can contact you, email or Facebook or Instagram. Can you give them email for the all of them? Yeah, uh, cool. Of course, if you want to chase me, it's Rockas, that's my name. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, yes. Hen me ka? Hen me. R O K S N. R O K E S. Ka. Rockas, that's me. Yes. At OCC.LT. That's the shortest one. Ka. Ah. สำหรับท่านใดที่อาจจะมีคำถามนะคะสามารถที่จะถามได้ในตอนเบรกนะคะ and right now we still have a refreshment during your refreshment maybe you have time for answer all question ค่ะค่ะขอเซฟรบมือให้กับคุณโลคาสิงห์นังคันนะคะ thank you so much thank you for your time ค่ะตอนนี้นะคะเล่นเชิญทุกท่านทันเบรกทันด้านหลังได้เลยนะคะและสำหรับห้องนี้นะคะก็มีทิ้งมุมคนหมดแล้วนะคะไว้เจอกันใหม่ในวันพรุ่งนี้ยังมีหัวข้อสำนานที่น่าสนใจค่ะขอบคุณค่ะ